Alors, bonjour, bienvenue à cette conférence de presse avec le ministre des Transports, Omar Gabra. Uh, so, uh, my name is Guillaume Saint-Pierre, I'll be your moderator. Uh, minister, we'll start with uh, quick uh, comments for about five minutes, and then we have uh, 20, 25 minutes of, uh, of questions. Allez-y, ministre. Thank you. Uh, Guillaume, good morning, everyone. Bonjour à tous. I'd like to uh, start by acknowledging that we're gathered today on the traditional territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples. Also want to wish everyone a happy National Tourism Week. I'm happy to be here for an announcement that I promise Canadian we will do. Because Canadians rely on the air sector and we need to ensure that their rights are even more protected. On doit protéger encore davantage leur droit. Our government was the first ever in Canada's history to put in place a Bill of Rights for air passengers which came into force in 2019. This regime gave Canadians important rights and protects them against flight delays and cancellations. Shortly after this regime came into force, the COVID-19 pandemic hit our air sector incredibly hard. The pandemic showed that there were some gaps in the regime. That's why we strengthened the protections last September to include refunds for situations outside the airline's control, such as a pandemic or a major weather event. Right now, everyone is entitled to a refund when the airlines are not able to complete the journey within a reasonable time frame. But last year, as the air sector began to recover, passenger volumes surged incredibly quickly, exposing the Bill of Rights to a lot of stress. As a result, we also saw passenger complaints increase at the Canadian Transportation Agency, leading to a significant backlog. These challenges have given us useful insight into how we can strengthen the rights and protect passengers even further. So this is exactly what we are doing. Today, I'm announcing that we are making significant changes to the air passenger rights. Genons de changement ou droit des passagers aériens. These changes are included in our Budget Implementation Act, Bill C-47, that was tabled in the House of Commons last Thursday, which we hope will pass soon. Once these measures are implemented, they will strengthen air passenger protection and simplify the complaint process. Among the new changes, amendments would make compensation the default unless specifically cited as a limited exception. Le compensation vont être obligatoire. So, in addition to being entitled to a refund, most air passengers will be entitled to fi financial compensation. Right now, compensation for delays and cancellation is only required for disruptions caused by the airline and which is not a safety issue. With the new changes, we would be combining the current three categories, which are disruption within the airline's control, within the airline's control but necessary for safety, and outside the control of the airline, into a single category where everyone would be entitled to compensation except for a clear list of exceptions. These exceptions would be established by the Canadian Transportation Agency through a regulatory process within which Canadian and industry stakeholders are consulted. This means there will be no more loopholes where airlines can claim a disruption is caused by something outside of their control for a security reason when it's not. And it will no longer be the passenger who will have to prove that he or she is entitled to compensation. It will now be the airline that will need to prove that it does not have to pay for it. This will make the process much simpler and push the burden of proof onto the airlines. The changes in the legislation would also include implementing standards of treatment, like paying for your food if your flight is cancelled or delayed due, for example, to a snowstorm. Since last summer, we also saw how lost baggage impacted passengers. 
That's why our proposed changes to the Bill of Rights would put in place new requirements which will be announced in the next few weeks for delayed and lost baggage. Il y a aura de nouvelles exigences pour le bagage. We will also require airlines to establish an internal process for dealing with air travel claims, and they will be required to manage passenger complaints within 30 days. We're also proposing to hold airlines more accountable by allowing the Canadian Transportation Agency to recover the cost of air passenger complaints from the airlines, giving, airline, giving airlines a stronger incentive to address complaints directly with travellers as soon as possible. Of course, we expect these measures will reduce the number of complaints referred to the agency, but for those that do reach the agency, we're proposing to make the process even more efficient. Under these amendments, the CTA would clear air passenger complaints sooner by replacing its current adju adjudication process for resolving disputes with a simplified process completed by their staff. These changes also build on the nearly $76 million over three years in added funding I recently announced to the agency to help clear the current backlog of complaints. Finally, to ensure even greater accountability, we are strengthening the CTA by increasing the maximum fines they can impose from $25,000 to $250,000. Les amants seront plus I know there may be some, mostly airlines, who claim that we are unfairly targeting them with these new measures to hold them accountable. First, let me be very clear. These measures are not meant to demonize airlines. Thousands of airline employees go to work every day committed to doing their best to provide excellent service to their customers. Airline employees have been going through an unprecedented period of challenges, and I know that they are doing their best under extraordinary circumstances. It's important, though, to acknowledge that when a passenger purchases a ticket, that is a transaction between a passenger and the airline. So it is the airline's responsibility to make sure they uphold their obligations to their customers. There's a significant imbalance in power here between airlines and their customers, where customers could suffer considerable consequences if a service they purchased was not delivered properly. I believe there is a role for government to fix this imbalance and help ensure that passengers are protected. I also want to be clear on another matter. We are still pursuing shared accountability across the sector by imposing new public data sharing requirements for airports and air carriers. We will also be requiring all those within the air transportation system to share more data with one another to ensure the best possible experience for passengers. More data sharing and greater transparency will enable the creation of a more accountable system for everyone. Stay tuned for additional measures to be announced in the coming months. Thank you again. Merci. OK, donc on passe au, à la période de questions. On en a pour euh, environ 25 minutes, euh, comme j'ai dit tantôt. Euh, on commence avec Judy Trim, CTV. Good morning, Ms. Minister. I'd like to know, you've said some exceptions. What are those exceptions that would not qualify for automatic compensation for passengers that you say are clearly outlined? I mean, there's the obvious one, um, a snowstorm. A, sto a snowstorm will have uh, obviously an impact on uh, traffic, uh, air traffic, and airlines are not responsible for snowstorms, just like snowstorms have an impact on uh, road traffic, on rail traffic. I think Canadians understand when there's a snowstorm. But let me just say that those specific ex examples will be sorted out in the consultation process. So the idea here is to be very narrow in what these exemptions or exceptions are and to be very clear for customers so they know what the expectations are and for airlines so they know what the expectations are. 
So given that last Christmas during that holiday season, there was a surge of complaints because of delays due to uh, a few days of a snowstorm, which are you saying that the majority of those individuals who filed claims over the holiday period, will it'll be unlikely for them to get compensation? Uh, first, let me just say that the majority uh, or I, you know, I'm not going to now speculate uh, because I don't have it in front of me what the percentage of complaints, but much of the complaints started in the summer, last summer, uh, at the start of the air sector after COVID. Uh, there were a lot of cancellation and, and delays because of operational challenges, surge in demand, uh, inability to provide that service. Um, so we're going to be very clear uh, about those type of delays and cancellation. Second, what we are proposing today is that there are new additional um, stricter requirements, even for snowstorms, when it comes to standard of treatment. So those who are, uh, whose planes were delayed because of a snowstorm, there's going to be a new standard of treatment that passengers need to be um, 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 uh, receiving from the airlines. Uh, for example, Type of food um, uh, that they should be provided while they're waiting uh, for a delay. So uh, second, they are still going to be entitled to a refund. If a flight is delayed or canceled because of a snowstorm and the customer wants a refund, they can ask for a refund. The, uh, uh, the other category we're talking about is additional compensation on top of the refund. Uh, Valérie uh, McCallabain, Radio-Canada. So airlines are saying that this should be a shared responsibility in, in some certain situation. What do you say to that when uh, delays are uh, because of security, because of, you know, no one's available to put uh, baggage, luggage on, on, on the planes, etc.? Yeah, let me again, I, and I referred to this in my remarks. Uh, let me just say first and foremost, um, Airlines are the ones who sold uh, a, a, a transaction, a, a contract to a customer. The customer paid the airlines to, do, to receive a service. Therefore, the airlines are responsible for delivering that service. Now, I do not deny the fact that the air sector is highly interdependent. And when certain um, things happen in one area, it has an impact on another uh, area. And therefore, that's why we are moving towards a shared accountability system. Uh, that would not be within the Air Passenger Bill of Rights because the Air Passenger Bill of Rights uh, is, is a regime that protects or covers the contract between the airlines and the passenger. The budget talks about uh, new data sharing and new information sharing that will enable a creation of a, a shared accountability in the system. So for example, now, when we have more information about the performance of the airport, the airline can hold, can hold the airport accountable if they fail to deliver on a certain standard. So that is something we're moving towards, uh, and, I, and I agree that it's going to be helpful for the increased efficiency of the system, but that's a different area than the Air Passenger Bill of Rights, but we're working on it. And I think the backlog of complaints is at 42,000 right now. What's, with this, these new measures, are we going to see them treated, uh, dealt with in a quicker fashion? Or are they, will they be allowed to get um, uh, reimbursed based on those new uh, rules? So um, there, this, uh, these changes are on top of the $76 million that I announced recently to the CTA. The CTA now has um, in, um, um, more resources to deal with the backlog. But yes, we are proposing new rules that, um, in my opinion, will first reduce the number of complaints the CTA receives because it's in the airline's vested interest that they deal with them before they go to the CTA. Uh, second, we're improving the efficiency of the process at the CTA. So when a CTA, when the CTA receives a complaint, they can 
process them much faster than the current process, so there is no need for it to go to an adjudicator anymore, and that CTA staff can make a decision on um, uh, a faster decision. So yes, it will improve the efficiency of handling complaints, and hopefully we can see these uh, that backlog uh, get dealt with much quicker. CP. Um, so these new provisions, the onus of proof is now on the airlines when it comes to um, any delays that they say is because of security reasons, but um, in the EU there are no exceptions. Another difference um, between what we were, what's proposed here and in the EU is um, passenger compensation is still not going to be automatic here, whereas it is there. So I'm just wondering why, why not align our policies with the EU when often they're kind of the gold standard when it comes to passenger protections? So my understanding is that the EU still has some exceptions for weather. Um, um, so the, we are uh, actually working on uh, understanding the and 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 benefiting from uh, the systems around the world in the EU and in the United States. Um, so there, uh, um, the EU has exemption for weather, and in the EU, the, com the customer still has to complain has to file a complaint. So we are actually consistent with the EU. In fact, we have stronger measures uh, being proposed in this bill uh, than the EU. Uh, standard uh, treatment, um, um, lost luggage or delayed luggage, the EU doesn't have uh, regulation for delayed luggage. So I would argue that this new proposal is tougher than the EU, and I, I would argue it is tougher than the United States. Thank you. And uh, my second question is with regards to um, the, the the powers, the greater powers that are be, being given to the CTA. Um, the agency, I mean, critics have have been have said that you know the agency hasn't always leaped into the defense of passengers or you know jumped to penalize airlines. And so I'm wondering to what extent is this legislation going to transform the agency into more of an enforcement body um, rather than a complaint handling tribunal? Uh, the um the additional resources to the CTA will help provide uh, more tools to the CTA so they're able to focus on not only managing complaints but also uh, uh, following up on enforcement. Second, the streamlining of the, the – reducing the number of complaints and the streamlining of the complaint process will again enable the CTA to – dedicate more resources to enforcement. So I feel str – and thirdly, increasing the fines, uh, it sends a signal to the CTA uh, that enforcement is an integral and important part of uh, their role. Uh, so I feel uh, that this will help provide more tools to the CTA, so not only to process complaints, but to ensure that the rights are enforced properly. Antoine Trépanier, Le Droit. Good morning, Minister. Um, my question is regarding the strike. Uh, PSAC is now aiming for ports and maybe even airports later on this week. Um, first, how do you react to their strategy? And can you tell us a little bit of your plan to limit uh, the disruption for Canadians? Um, look, we're, uh, uh, you know, I've repeated before, our government repeated before, is that the best way to reach a resolution is at the negotiation table. Um, and I hope um, that we're able to reach a resolution soon. I, I, I feel, you know, it's the last thing that Canadians want to deal with today uh, is additional disruptions to how um, – um, to things or services that they need. Uh, so I uh, – but I do believe that the best way to reach a resolution is at the negotiation table. We are uh, – Transport Canada's um, – um, employees, the significant majority of them are considered essential, so things that are related to safety and enforcement uh, um, are functioning well. Uh, we have reached out to airports, to ports, to others to make sure that we're coordinating together in case uh, there are uh, pickets or disruptions. There are some minor administrative things that may have an impact. Um, uh, for now, we haven't seen that yet, but we're uh, following and monitoring the situation, and I hope that we don't see any significant disruptions uh, to the flow of passengers and goods. Um, what is the proportion of uh, the public servants in your department who are still working? Um, 
business as usual uh, and are not participating uh, in the strike? And what is the impact uh, with, uh, regarding your partnership with vendors or partners uh, that you might have uh, this strike? So two-thirds of Transport Canada's employees are considered essential workers. Um, and the other, there's some aspects that are not essential. Some of them, as I said, are administrative, like uh, processing licenses or, or certificates, uh, call centers. So uh, we are monitoring what kind of impact that will have. It hasn't so far been um, uh, at least felt by uh, the general public. But will uh, and because um, you know managers management at at uh, at TC or Transport Canada is doing their best to uh, to fill in the gaps, but certainly we have to keep monitoring uh, what kind of additional impact it could have. David Thirteen, uh, CBC. Hi, Minister. Um, a transit stakeholder group is meeting on the Hill today, and they're going to be talking to the media. And uh, they're going to be talking about ways to address violence on, um, you know, regional, local transportation systems. Uh, are, are you concerned about the violence that we're seeing on these transportation systems? And do you think that there is a role for the federal government to help? First, uh, uh, let me be very clear. I am extremely concerned about uh, the recent uh, increase in violence on local transit um, around the country. And um, the federal, while again, law enforcement and the management of public transit is the responsibility of local municipality and sometimes provinces, uh, the federal government will be there if, if there's a, a, a role for the federal government to offer assistance, we will be there. And I'm very much interested in hearing recommendation from municipalities on what can the federal government do to, um, um, to stamp down uh, this new phenomena. Okay, and coming back to your announcement today, I have a whole list of questions. Um, how will these changes apply to passengers who are getting, get, getting on planes for spring break, for summer vacation? I'm assuming this will not help them. And how do you respond to maybe airlines who are listening to your announcement and we'll say, well, oh, well, we're going to have to increase our fees if we're going to have a $250,000 fine. And then finally, does this apply to, you know, Rio Rail? So those three questions, please. Um, let me start with the last question. This is an Air Passenger Bill of Rights. Uh, so unless VIA starts uh, selling airline tickets, um, it doesn't apply to VIA. Uh, however, let me just say that I'm uh, still waiting for uh, the internal review uh, is being done, conducted by VIA, by a third party on what had happened over Christmas period to see what recommendations we need to uh, uh, put in place. Uh, there's going to be uh, a new CEO announced shortly for VIA, so there's work ongoing there. Um, um, look, this bill, uh, the Budget Implementation Act, um, will have some changes, once it passed, will have some changes that get Im immediately um, uh, implemented, and some changes will still require regulatory changes that will require consultation. So as soon as the bill is passed, some changes will take effect immediately, and it could have an impact on the spring uh, travel season. On the question of airlines, um, again, I know the thousands of airline employees have been working incredibly hard to deal with extraordinary circumstances. And I know sometimes they faced uh, uncalled for angry customers who are unhappy. So I would like to remind all Canadians to uh, understand the difficult job that airline workers and thank them uh, for doing their best. But I want to make sure that given what we saw last summer and over Christmas, um, that it's clear that there are some loopholes that needed to be closed and that passengers, um, as I said, the imbalance of power between passenger and airlines are, uh, are, are improved. 
if an airline, I, I think this is an opportunity for airlines instead of thinking about, oh, let's increase fees, is that this is an opportunity actually to reduce the number of complaints and reduce cost. If airlines is ab are air able to deal with these issues and minimize the number of complaints up front, they are going to see a significant reduction in cost. That is the ultimate objective. Happier customer, reduce costs for airlines. And if an airline chooses the easy way is, oh, let's just respond by increasing our fees, I think they're going to hopefully find another airline that sees a path to increase the market share by keeping their fees low and reducing the number of complaints. So I let the market forces determine that. But I really think airlines left government no choice after what we saw to further clarify the rules and make sure that passenger rights are protected. Yeah, so we uh, have two more questions in the room and two uh, online. I don't know if it's, uh, it's good for you, Minister. Yeah, good. Uh, Emilie Bergeron, Presse Canadienne. Um, hi, Minister. Um, so the list of, of exemptions uh, for compensations, when, uh, how long could it take uh, for, for us to see that? Uh, you mentioned consultation, so how long would it take uh, for Canadians to um, have uh, these uh, reinforcements as, as you, you picture? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. Um, as soon as the bill passes, hopefully this spring, um, before the House rises for the summer um, or sooner. Uh, the CTA will begin the regulatory process. There is a defined process of, of uh, it's publishing the initial draft of the regulation, consulting, um, but I would really like to see it pass as quickly as possible and hopefully before the end of the year. But you're going to see you're going to see the draft way before they become uh, law. So you're going to, uh, Canadians are going to be able to see these proposed exemptions publicly very soon, hopefully by the summer, uh, and Canadians will be able to offer their input into what the drafts are, and then um, it will be cemented before the end of the year. Um, and to come back to the strike, um in in the in the changes you propose uh, today, um, you want to reduce the the time to deal with uh, with complaints. Uh, so, if the strike uh, continues for for weeks to go, um, what could be the impact on your capacity to do to do just that to reduce the time to deal with complaints if there is a, a, a bigger backlog? Yeah, look, I. <laughs> Ideally, the strike does not last very long. Uh, I, uh, I am hoping that uh, negotiators are able to resolve this as quickly as possible because you're right, the longer the strike goes, the longer the impact it's going to have on different services that Canadians expect, including an impact on, uh, on the process of the CTA. So if the strike uh, uh, lasts long, we could see an impact. So I, I'm just hoping that we find a way to resolve the strike as quickly as possible. Uh, Marco, iPolitics. Um, you know, you, it, it kind of seems like these changes are being uh, framed as a response to the airlines seeing loopholes or seizing loopholes in existing uh, regulations, considering I think most Canadians' experiences trying to get a refund or some form of compensation from the airlines it seems like it could have been anticipated. So what do you make of, you know, some comments that how, you know, why did it take this long to put in these measures that shift the onus away from the customers lodging a complaint to the airlines to kind of uh, act um, uh, in a certain prescribed manner? Uh, look, uh, in 2019, it was, uh, in fact, in the fall of 2019 was when the Passenger Bill of Rights came into force. Uh, and when it came into force, it was way stronger than the, um, uh, than the comparable system in the United States. Uh, uh, it was based on consultation. It was based on studies of uh, comparable systems around the world. And we felt at the time, given that it was the first time rolling out the system, it was um, proper and adequate uh, for our air sector. 
As I said, it's, uh, uh, the pandemic has clearly stressed the system and exposed vulnerabilities. So any responsible government would, uh, uh, would benefit uh, from those lessons, and we are acting on what we learned from this extraordinary period, and as, you, as I said today, we are implementing uh, these lessons learned. And just to kind of follow up on someone else's question, um, timeline-wise, if the strike link lasts for you know, next month or so, um, how does that kind of impact the implementation process here? Can we really realistically expect that um, this, these new rules will come into place um, shortly after the legislation receives rail, rail assent, if you know, this strike lasts you know, the next month or so? Uh, I mean, it's a hypothetical question, but let me just say the bill needs to pass first. Um, and I, I'm, it's hard for me to guess how long the bill is going to take to pass. I hope soon. I hope within weeks, and I hope by the time the bill passes that the strike is resolved. Um, uh, so hopefully it won't have an impact on the implementation of the bill. But again, those are hypothetical. That's a hypothetical question, but I feel uh, hopeful and confident that we won't see an impact on the, pro uh, on the implementation of the bill. So just before going online, I'm, if, if, uh, if you don't mind, I'll just ask a question myself on the strike. Um, it seems that, like, uh, right now we're into in the uh, uh, phase, of, you know, the battle for the uh, public opinion phase with all the mudslinging that we've seen this weekend. What makes you think that you can win that battle? Um, you know, negotiations uh, can be tough sometimes. It's uh, not unusual uh, to see uh, tension between union and employers uh, in the middle of a negotiation. Each side is trying to, uh, you know, get a fair deal. We certainly want a fair deal. Um, but again, I'm, I, I don't think it's unusual for tension to run high in the middle of negotiation. In fact, I would argue the higher the tension, that means maybe we're closer to reaching a deal. So I'm only hoping that we are closer to reaching a deal. Hey, two quick questions online. Uh, Josh Rubin, Toronto Star. Just a sec, I'll just uh, unmute you. Hi, Minister. Thanks for taking the question. Um, I, I, I'm just uh, wondering, the, the current procedure, uh, the current complaints procedure has some timelines and vision too, you know, like roughly 120 days start to finish. Um, the new one... What, what, what makes you confident that the CTA will be able to meet the timelines in the new complaints, uh, in, the, in the new complaint system? You know, like point, point taken that it's a more efficient process, um, but I'm like wondering what, what makes you so confident that they'll be able to meet the timelines in the, in the new timelines uh, envisioned under these changes to the legislation? And also what are the consequences if the CTA doesn't meet the timelines for solving complaints? Uh, yeah, thank you for this question, and uh, I'll try to repeat the answer again. We've, we've done def different, several things uh, in this proposal. First, uh, we're clarifying any type of potential confusion about when the airlines is responsible for compensation. Uh, so hopefully that will reduce the number of complaints. Um, second, we're telling the airlines that if the complainant goes to the CTA, that the airlines will... Uh, have to cover the cost of the CTA complaint. So that creates also another incentive for airlines to resolve, resolve complaints before the complainants go into the CTA, which hopefully will reduce the number of complaints. Uh, third, uh, we are uh, improving uh, the efficiency of the handling of the, uh, of the complaint, and it doesn't need to go to an adjudicator anymore and let CTA employees deal with this complaint. So that's another uh, area of reducing um, backlog. Uh, fourth, providing uh, additional resources of $76 million for the next three years to the CTA. Um, so uh, all that to say is that uh, I feel confident that the new framework is going to significantly reduce the need for customers to go to the CTA for complaints and improve the process efficiency for CTA to deal with these complaints uh, and makes me feel confident that uh, the CTA is going to be able to manage complaints at a much quicker rate. Mm -hmm. one, one quick, one quick follow-up, though. I mean, like, are there any consequences, like, if... 
if the CTA doesn't meet the mandated timelines? The CTA is a, a quasi-judicial body that is independent uh, from government. Having said that, uh, uh, government and I will work with them on making sure that they meet uh, those expectations, and and um, uh, I will certainly get their input on on um, on what they need to meet these uh, uh, the, those uh, those expectations. So we're reducing it, by the way, just to. Uh, just to be clear for uh, uh, for Canadians, the current process was 120 days. The new in the new proposal will be 90 days. I feel confident, and we will work with CTA in making sure that they meet those uh, those timelines. Okay, last question, Xiao uh, uh, Li Li uh, Rogers. Hi, thanks. This may be an obvious question or answer, but why, why is this included as part of the budget bill? Because you're asking for votes on something where a significant element of what you're proposing, that list of exemptions for compensation is still, you know, to be done through the regulatory process. And that list is really kind of what's really important because that's something that the airlines are alleged to have abused. So why is this going as part of the budget bill instead of getting that list of exemptions done first and then introducing this as something separate? Uh, first of all, uh, it is common for budget bills to include administrative uh, changes to our, uh, our laws. Uh, this is an administrative change. Uh, second, um, it's going to require regulatory change. So first, um, the exemptions need to be identified through a regulatory process. So first, we need the legislative authority to change the regulation, which what the budget bill is doing, and then we need to go through a regulatory process to uh, list those exemptions. Right, but are you not concerned? Sorry, thank you for that, but this is my follow-up. Are you not concerned? Because, of course, that, that list of exemptions is precisely the problem that we ran into because we had airlines allegedly citing exemptions that were not necessarily uh, convincing, let's say, and we have critics who have said that you know, the, this kind of thing needs to be toughened up. Are you not concerned about that process? Uh, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, but again, we couldn't, it, it first, it needs to be done at the regulatory level. But we couldn't start the regulatory process to make these changes before getting the legislative cover for it. So that's why we need to get the legislative authority first, and then we need to go through these changes through regulatory changes. So that's why this order of, of uh, uh, is taking place. We need to get the regulatory cover, uh, the, sorry, the legislative cover for it for first, and then we need to go through a regulatory change process um, through regulation. We, ca we couldn't start in reverse. We couldn't start uh, in the regulatory process without getting a legislative authority. Alors, c'est ce qui met fin à la conférence de presse. Thanks, Minister, for staying a bit longer. It's an important uh, subject for uh, Thank you all Canadians. for being here. Thank you. Thank you.